Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for responding so quickly. Um, the form will be the same as before. We will take uh, contributions from our two uh, uh, table speakers. Uh, Lord Carlyle will go first, and then uh, Professor Donahue. Uh, and at, uh, after they're both finished, then we'll have questions. We'll take them in orders of three. Uh, and as I said before, some of you may have heard me say this yesterday, uh, I admire succinct questions and even succinct comments, uh, but I'm deeply unimpressed by speeches uh, because we must ensure that the majority of people who want to get the opportunity of questioning, which I'm sure are going to be two very interesting and thought-provoking contributions to our debate. Uh, just one historical point. Uh, it was, uh, there was a reference made a little earlier this morning to Earl Haig, uh, who had a rather undistinguished career, according to some, in the First World War, and who became a Chancellor of St Andrews University, uh, and was himself from time to time described as a butcher, but we had a rather more historical butcher than that, uh, and that was the Duke of Cumberland, who uh, was responsible for uh, quashing the 1745 rebellion led by that iconic figure, Bonnie Prince Charlie. And after he had done for the Jacobites uh, in Scotland, uh, he was appointed to be Chancellor of St Andrews University on the basis, we can only assume, that St Andrews was a nest of Jacobites itself uh, and had to be dealt with very severely. So in this business, you learn something new every day. Uh, first then, to uh, address this, I call upon uh, Alex Carlyle, perhaps. I should do the... Um, uh, curriculum vitae, uh, cur curricula vitae of uh, our contributors first. Um, I always feel on these occasions it would be qu quite the right thing to tell you to open your book and for two minutes read uh, what is set down because both of those who are going to speak to us have got the most distinguished uh, backgrounds. Uh, Dr. Donahue, uh, Dr. Bigger pardon, Dr. Donahue, Professor of Law at Georgetown, Director of Georgetown Centre on National Security. Director of the Centre of Privacy and Technology, writes on foreign intelligence, biological weapons, biometric identification. She's, and this is just me reading shortly, uh, she's had articles published in pretty well every review, every law review you can think of, including the Stanford Law Review, uh, which is uh, of some significance to me because I was a postgraduate there for a year. Uh, she has an AB, an MA, a JD, uh, and a PhD, and she has been positively um, international in her academic career. Dartmouth, uh, the University of Ulster, uh, Stanford, and then Cambridge. That's, that's a pretty good quartet, to put it mildly. Uh, and Lord Carlyle, who is, like myself, a former Liberal Democrat member of Parliament, with whom I shared a room in the House of Commons just a few years ago, well, actually quite a few, and uh, nowadays we share a room in the House of Lords. Uh, a Welshman uh, called to the bar by Gray's Inn in 1970 and became Queen's Counsel in 94 at the age of 36. I think, if my memory serves me right, one of the youngest ever to be admitted to the rank of Queen's Counsel. He has been the Deputy High Court Judge, Chairman of the Competition Appeal Tribunal. He was awarded the CBE for his contribution uh, on behalf of the government as the government's principal advisor on uh, legislation with regard to terrorism and he has since created uh, his own uh, organization, his own company, SC Strategy Limited, which is, provides strategic in, uh, advice uh, and is available for foreign and public policy consultancy. They are stratospherically achievers you couldn't possibly afford them, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> my very good friend, Lord Carlyle. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Ming, for that introduction. Um, and particularly for the short lesson in Scottish history. In all the years I've shared a parliamentary office with uh, Mingis Campbell, I've had quite a few lessons in Scottish history, but not that particular one. So there really is something new on every occasion. I'm delighted to be here with these two great universities, and I want to thank uh, Georgetown for the wonderful hospitality we have had. 
When Lord Campbell was opening the whole proceeding yesterday, he commented that um, we are often taken by surprise that um, when 9-11 happened, we didn't seem quite to know what was coming or to be properly uh, prepared for it. And that was actually inexcusable um, because it had been predicted. For example, in 1998, a British government policy paper contained the following. And there is the potential, if the right targets are hit, such as strategic computer systems running banking or air traffic control operations, to affect thousands or even millions of people. Such technologies could not have been envisaged when the existing counter-terrorism legislation was framed over 20 years ago, but the powers available in future must be adequate and flexible enough to respond to the changing nature of the terrorist threat, both now and in the years to come. So there was a prescient warning, which basically lay on a dusty shelf for the next two and a half years. An example, if you'll forgive one anecdote, of the fact that we really didn't see what was coming was what happened to me on the morning, British time, of the 11th of September, 2001. It was about four in the morning here, but about nine in the morning in London, when I received a call in my law office from the then Home Secretary of the United Kingdom. And he said to me, we'd like you to consider being independent reviewer of terrorism legislation, uh, a role that at that time only existed in the United Kingdom and now also exists in Australia. And I was lucky enough to be able to help the Australians to create that role. It's a bit different from ours. I don't know if any of you have met Dr. James Rennick, senior counsel, who is the Australian counter-terrorism um, independent monitor, but he has uh, done some very interesting work. But anyway, on that morning about 9 a.m., as I said, I was asked to be the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation, and the minister said to me, it's all about Northern Ireland. Uh, you'll be taking over from a predecessor who will help you a great deal. It probably won't take more than about nine or 10 days a year because things are going really well. Um, about uh, four or five hours later, the Twin Towers were hit. And this made, meant a great deal to me as it happened because about nine weeks earlier, I had been to the top of one of the Twin Towers and had seen what they were and what they stood for and what they meant in New York City. The uh, Home Office uh, telephoned me during the afternoon, two or three hours after the event, and memorably, uh, the Home Secretary's private secretary said to me, um, we think it might involve a bit more work now, Lord Carlyle. And I replied, the only person I have told is my wife, because I felt I should, because terrorism is involved. Um, but if you want someone competent to do the job, I won't be offended, because nobody has been told. So they said, um, no, we'd like you to continue, but it'll probably take about 30 to 40 days a year. Well, in my first year, it took 176 days, and for the next nine and a half years, it continued at something of that pace. And um, I knew nothing about terrorism at the, at the time. I was a very experienced trial lawyer, including in the criminal courts, but I'd never done a terrorist case. So I got in touch with the relevant government department and I said to them, where should I go to try and learn about the terrorist threat? And they said, go to St. Andrews. Go and see Paul Wilkinson. So I went to St. Andrews and I met Paul Wilkinson and we became good friends and I spent two days in a dusty attic office which you could barely move around because of the piles of books which were piled or not piled in some cases, on the floor of his room. And I was rightly advised to go and see Paul Wilkinson, and I have great respect for what he did and what is continued in the department at St Andrews and, of course, the uh, partnership with Georgetown University. Um, the Independent Reviewer of Terrorism Legislation, as I've already said, is a creature who only exists in the United Kingdom and in Australia, so far as I'm aware. 
um, there was an attempt to try and bring some of the elements of that job to the United States. Um, Quintin Viktorovich, who some of you I think will know, um, came to London and was embedded in the United States Embassy in London for about a year and a half, maybe a little more, and came back, and his brief when he returned, as I understood it at least, was to try and produce a thread of consistent policy countering violent extremism in the United States. It didn't really work, not through any fault of his, but because you have in the United States such an extraordinarily devolved system of government that it's very difficult to persuade the constituent parts to do the same thing universally. And you know that piece better than I. But the independent reviewer's job is an important one, I would claim, not just because I did it, but because it speaks truth to power. And one of the things that academics have to do is not campaign, I'll come back to that theme a little bit later, but use your research so that you can speak truth to the executive and political branches of government so that when they exercise the levers of power, they know what they're doing, and if they get it wrong, they're rightly blamed for doing the wrong thing. And the situation in the United Kingdom is a good example of this now. Um, Lord Campbell and I were in the 1987 to 1992 Parliament, where, if I remember rightly, Prime Minister Thatcher had a majority of 102, the biggest majority, uh, unt the biggest majority that's been in our time, but Boris Johnson has come close to it. His um, majority, as stated, is in truth bigger because there are a number of Sinn Féin members of parliament who do not attend on principle. So the government is as powerful as the Thatcher government was between 1987 and 1992. And clever as many of them are, and some of them, including the prime minister, are remarkably clever, they're also remarkably opinionated. One of the things you have to remember about Boris Johnson is that he's really a journalist. Um, and, you know, that may be praise, but not 100% praise. So truth to power is very much needed. The Australian monitor has some statutory power. He has the power to uh, have orders made uh, in Parliament. He has the power to call witnesses and make them attend before him formally. The British Independent Reviewer of Terrorism um, Legislation, and there have been two since me, I call the current one my grandson, um, uh, they do not have any formal power except the power to name and shame. And just to give you an example, I've had occasions when I have written draft reports, sent them through to the relevant government department for factual correction and be called in because there's been a decision, decision to change policy before my report was published criticising the policy for the time being. That's a peculiar British, peculiarly British way of doing things, but it does work in our jurisdiction. The most difficult part of terrorism legislation, and legislation is my theme this morning, is what we call prevent. Prevent is one of the four parts of the counter-terrorism strategy known as contest, or as someone said yesterday, contest. I'm not sure which is right. Anyway, I call it contest. It's prevent. Uh, prevent is the uh, part of counterterrorism policy which is designed to do what it says on the tin, prevent people from becoming terrorists by identifying them and taking them, if they are willing, because it's entirely voluntary, into programs in which it is hoped they can be persuaded to be terrorists no more. And there are many success stories and many um, failures. And also there are many references which were appropriate and there were many references which were inappropriate. So it's unsurprisingly a policy that causes a great amount of controversy. It's not helped by academics, and I say that with great <coughs> caution in this august gathering, and I do not for one moment single out a single academic from St Andrews or Georgetown or any of the other universities that I'm involved with, notably King's College London and the University of Swansea, the Hillary Rodham Clinton School of Law at Swansea University. They're all good, but <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't be working with them. But, but, on Prevent, there are maybe 200 papers 
by academics, I've read them all, by academics who are campaigning, who start with the assumption that prevent is bad and then justify it in their academic research. And frankly, they're no help to anyone. We're back to the question of talking truth to power. Academics have a value if they put together good quality research, make an ethical analysis of what they have done, turn it into propositions, which are more easily understood than some academic product I've read, and then give it to power as truth. And the sorts of academics represented here today are exactly that kind of valuable of contributor, but it is not always so. The quality of legislation um, in the United Kingdom um, has a different, is, is quite high on the whole. It has a pretty different gestation from the United States. Um, Parliament and um, the Hill are very much an example of division by a common language. The whole dynamics, the whole process of different, is different. And the essence of the difference is that you in the United States have a very strong executive arm of government. It's unimaginable that even a powerful prime minister like Margaret Thatcher or Boris Johnson could create new foreign policy by the use of 120 letters a few times a day or whatever the permissible uh, amount of a tweet is now. It just wouldn't happen because there is no measurable executive power outside parliament in the United Kingdom. Even when there's a big majority government, it's subject to parliamentary scrutiny. And I think Yu Ming would probably agree with me that there are some issues, however big the government's majority, on which MPs would just rebel. Mm -hmm. They just wouldn't follow their government. So there's that um, dynamic. I'm not <laughs> saying that the United Kingdom is a paragon of democracy. It's just a different kind of system. There is a danger, though, where parliament is making most of the decisions of reactive um, legislation. We have a, a newspaper in the United Kingdom called the Daily Mail. It's worth looking at the Mail online. It's quite an attractive read. It follows the opinion which it perceives the public has. For example, last Sunday, it had 21 articles on Meghan <laughs> and Harry. Just while the government was pursuing successfully its Brexit departure legislation through Parliament. But it judged Meghan and Harry to be of much more interest. Yeah, they're a bit interesting, but in truth, in political terms, they don't matter at all. And uh, the Daily Mail online has uh, in its uh, home news something called by politicians the sidebar of shame, because we all read it regularly to make sure that we're not in it, hopefully. <laughs> And you know, Ming and I have occasionally appeared in the sidebar of shame, but usually in a moderately respectable way. <laughs> so there is a danger. The reason for mentioning that is a serious one. There is a danger that when something happens, like the recent murder of two people by a former terrorist convict who was perceived to be a reformed character, went to a seminar where he was to speak about being a reformed character and why, went out and killed two people with a knife whilst wearing a fake suicide vest before the police shot him dead. Um, there, is, there is a danger that that kind of event will lead to the demand something has to be done and then inappropriate legislation is introduced. One of the roles of the Independent Reviewer of Terrorism Legislation, this is a statutory role, is to uh, comment by reports uh, which are published on the government's proposals for new legislation. Uh, there are some in existence at the moment, and the current uh, Independent Reviewer, Jonathan Hall QC, has already commented on them. And another of the roles is to anticipate what might be proposed by the government or should be proposed by the government and state publicly what the outcome should be. And it's these days a very public role. And in my view, whichever country it is that is proposing legislation for dealing with terrorism must be ethical about it and determine that all new legislation should be proactive, not reactive. In other words, we should create legislation that is 
broad enough to anticipate what might happen in the future, though, say, um, in 2000, when the main piece of legislation, the Terrorism Act 2000, was enacted, we had no idea what was going to happen in the next two years, never mind the next 20 years. But it has to be robust enough to meet need without breaching fundamental constitutional rights. Now, of course, we don't have a constitution, and we regard that as a virtue. You do have a constitution, and you regard that as a virtue. So there we are. It pays your money, and you take your choice. But in the end, we're trying to achieve the same kind of thing. And the creation of legislation has to be both in accordance with public policy and has to meet the appetite of the courts, because when you create le criminal legislation, a lot of cases are going to end up in court. Now, I have spent much of my life as a trial advocate, uh, times appearing for prosecution and for defense in major criminal cases, and also do the, doing other types of uh, litigation. And, I can, w w and we have, just like you, we have juries in the United Kingdom in Scotland, they have juries of 15. In England and Wales, we have juries of 12. But we do not have a sophisticated, which may be a slightly over-complementary term, jury selection process as you have in the United States. We take our juries as they walk into court in almost all instances, entirely random, straight off the electoral roll. People can find themselves serving on a jury um, judging issues that they know a great deal about with other juries who know absolutely nothing about the subject. We don't have the level of examination you have here. But what those of us who've knocked around the courts in all kinds of cases for many years know, and we can give examples, is that juries do not like legislative overreach. There's a proposal about in Britain at the moment, to revive the law of treason. Um, it's a political um, bid. Um, people like us know that there are other crimes, serious crime, crimes like conspiracy to murder or murder, um, that can be charged in all cases which would fall within the definition of treason. The other thing we know is that some juries, and there's absolutely no record of what juries say to one another, there's complete secrecy in the jury room and it's a criminal offence to reveal it or even to research it in most instances, we know that juries would react badly and probably refuse to convict in some cases where the evidence was overwhelming because they would say there had been a legislative overreach. Um, in addressing juries over the years, um, Alex Carlyle's speech number five, open brackets, one's close brackets, open brackets, B, close brackets, involves reminding the jury that uh, sitting on a jury is much the most democratic thing they will do in their lives. Um, far more democratic than voting in the occasional general election because they as citizens will have a dramatic effect on the life not only of the defendant in front of them but on a whole host of other people whose lives may have been dramatically affected by the case in question. So it's very important for there to be a very great degree of care and responsibility in the form of legislation we have. Now, I could take you through a list, but there isn't time, of inchoate offences which have been created around terrorism, and I've written about this, um, including incitement, attempt, uh, aiding and abetting. Aiding and abetting... Nice old phrase, been around for hundreds of years, certainly since 1189, um, can include, for example, providing bed and board to people you know as terrorists. Hiding them in a cupboard when the police come by can land you in prison for a long time. So we have to be very careful in ensuring that um, the criminal uh, offences that we produced are proportionate and do not, to use the word again, overreach. We have some major problems at the present time resulting only in part from the Fishmongers Hall London Bridge incident of December which I described a few minutes ago. Um, it is absolutely clear that the uh, in-prison projects which are designed to help prisoners to de-radicalize 
And the projects um, which are designed to avoid prisoners who are not terrorists, who are actually radicalized in prison. Prison is an extraordinarily boring place. And going to Friday prayers is at least something to do. One can understand in sociological terms how people are radicalized. But the programs that have been developed to deal with those issues have plainly been inadequate. And uh, also, the release provisions for people who've been convicted of terrorist acts are not adequate. Now, I echo the words of Lord Evans yesterday when he said that judges should tell the truth. I've sat as a judge for many years, and if I've said to someone, you will go to prison for 10 years, I know it's a lie. Because in the United Kingdom, that means he goes to prison for five years, and he gets five years knocked off, not for good behavior, automatically. And I agree with Lord Evans that judges should tell prisoners the truth. And when they say you're going to prison for 10 years, you're going to prison for 10 years. Um, but um, dealing with people who go to prison for a long period of time and then come out unreconstructed and dangerous, that presents a real challenge in a liberal democracy like ours. Because it just won't do, to, at the end of a sentence, to say to someone, well, actually, we've changed our minds because you're a dangerous guy, so you're going to stay in prison for the rest of your life until we decide it's safe to release you. That would undoubtedly be shot down by our Supreme Court in a manner of minutes. So it's a much more complicated problem than it's ever presented as. So just to wrap up, the message I really wanted to give you this morning as my thesis is the development of uh, counterterrorism legislation is very difficult. There are many countries with extremely good black letter counterterrorism legislation, but the way they apply it can be extremely questionable. Good countries with good democracies, good parliaments, good, good professional ethics provide laws which are practicable, proportionate, and applicable. And I believe that one of the things that academics, like those very distinguished academics here today and yesterday can do, is to help the polity of our countries to achieve just that. <clears throat> and now, Professor Donahue. Thank you very much, and thank you, Lord Campbell, for your generous and very kind introduction. Uh, it's very much appreciated. I'd also like to thank Bruce and Tim for holding this conference. This is just a tremendous opportunity to really explore these issues. And I've long had a relationship, actually, with St. Andrews. It started when I was a graduate student in Northern Ireland, and I went to go see Paul Wilkinson to talk to him about terrorism. And it, I returned many times to St. Andrews throughout my time in Northern Ireland, then down at Cambridge when I was at University of Edinburgh. And it's just really nice to have this opportunity to rekindle that friendship and continue the intellectual dialogue. I'd also like to uh, thank Lord Carlyle. It's both a pleasure and a privilege to meet him. I have followed his work for years. It's had a tremendous influence on my own research and my own work. In fact, it's still being discussed amongst academics. I was in, in October, I was at an Offenses Against the State Act conference at Dublin at Trinity, and there was a very lively debate about some of your previous reports and the implications now and how to think about it. And I'm happy to say that, you know, Gerard Hogan, Clive Walker, and I, we were debating prevent, um, not in a, um, a campaign way, Way, but in a really concerted discussion of what's the best way forward. So your work has had a profound influence on both sides of the Atlantic as well as across, across the Irish Sea. Just as Lord Carlyle uh, discussed and addressed the statutory framing, I'm going to move now to a more doctrinal or principled or valued framing. And my basic contention and concern here is that actually there's a conflagration behind us. This reminds me a little bit of Plato's allegory of the cave, that we're looking at shadows on the wall in terms of these movements and missing the fire that's burning behind us. And what's most concerning to me intellectually is that this is a fire, the oxygen of which is democratic values. So it is being driven by some of those values that are so central to our two countries and to our understanding of democracy that it really threatens to undo the entire fabric of the society itself. What are these values? Were they the values, at least in the United States, that are enshrined in our First Amendment? The First Amendment, to remind you of the language, is that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech 
or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redresses of grievances. Now, the associative rights, the, what we refer to as the associative rights, the right of free speech, uh, the press and assembly, these rights are the oxygen uh, that in their interplay with social media in particular, I think is driving a lot of the violence and will drive future violence uh, that we see. This, these principles, these associative principles, are animated by six values. This is common in US constitutional law, how we think about it. Those six values are democratic self-governance, this idea that we have to be able to debate political views and different political ideas in order to have the best representative democracy that we can, and that we can develop our own ideas about what we see as appropriate. Second, that you have to discover truth, and you have to have a marketplace of ideas to do this. And the government is not the right individual to make the choice which ideas are legitimate and which aren't. Uh, the basic idea is truth will out. And so you have these debates about the proper way to approach things. Advancing autonomy is a third principle that underlies the First Amendment. This idea that actually you need to be able to debate to develop who you are in a humanistic sense, to develop your ideas, your thoughts, your beliefs, your understandings, to develop as a person, to be an autonomous individual in the world. Fourth, that you promote tolerance. Here in the United States, we come from every country in the world. We have every religion represented here, and we have to get used to being offended. So when people say nasty things, you have to not end up in fisticuffs every time, right? Chaplinsky, right? There's this idea that you have to get used to being offended because that's what it means to have a pluralistic, liberal society, small l. The fifth reason is for social uh, cohesion. Unless we're in common conversation, unless we have that debate and that open airing, then you end up in fragmented world. And finally, the sixth and most important is the liberty right, the absence of constraint. So when I look at these values against social media and what's happening, uh, I see that these values are precisely what social media promotes. And the protection of these rights, so these principles, in our First Amendment doctrine actually is creating a situation which can ultimately really undermine the democracy and lead to some very serious impact on the United States as well as the United Kingdom and other democratic governments. So what I'd like to do um, is I'd like to uh, focus my remarks on seven areas in particular of social media and ways in which these areas are deeply concerning in light of political violence. First is the revolutionary nature of social media. Second is its emotional impact. Third is the construction of false reality that we see. Fourth is societal disruption. Fifth is that it is privately controlled by companies. Sixth is the vulnerability to manipulation with the advances that we see in social network analytics and with algorithmic analyses. Uh, and seventh are the trends. What we're seeing coming down the pike is ephemeral content, niche marketing, the increase in nano and micro influencer use, and augmented and virtual reality. All right, so let's talk first about the revolutionary nature of this. Uh, this is a revolution. Uh, that we're seeing in terms of social relationships. So there are 3.5 billion people worldwide who use social media. So let's think about that, 3.5 billion people. In the United States, 80% of our population is on social media. That's about 247 million people. In the United Kingdom, 67 percent of the population is on social media. Uh, so that's about 45 million people. And what we're seeing is it's a higher number amongst younger people. So the United Kingdom, for instance, 94% of individuals aged 24, sorry, 25 to 34 use it. 98% of people aged 16 to 24 in the United Kingdom are on social media. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, 75 and above, only 38% are on social media. Even this number is, has doubled in three years, the number of people 75 and over. So the trend is towards almost 100% use of social media in these societies. There are a number of super sites that really control this. So Facebook has 2.4 billion users worldwide right now. 2.41 billion people. Uh, in the United States, there are 240 million. In the UK, 44 million people use Facebook in the United Kingdom. WhatsApp has 1.5 billion active users globally. 60 billion messages a day are being sent. LinkedIn has 260 million active users globally. 146 million in the United States. 27 million in the United Kingdom. Twitter has 30, 336 million people globally who use Twitter. Um, 
Now, this is an entirely new kind of social relationship that's being established through social media. And it's not just one kind of relationship. There are seven or eight in the taxonomy of social media that are being developed that did not exist before. Right, so these are new relationships that we're seeing. The first kind uh, of, uh, is networking, right? So Facebook, uh, it's the number three most visited site in the United States. Uh, these are being used for terrorist purposes, right? If you think about actually what's being done, Sri Lanka, uh, the attacks in Sri Lanka used Facebook beforehand. They were announced beforehand when they, that they were going to engage in this. LinkedIn, Google, Swarm. Uh, Swarm is spun off of Foursquare, for those of you in the social media world. It was in May 2014. Uh, this is one whole kind of social media networking, but it's not the only kind, right? We also have product and service uh, reviews and recommendations like Yelp and TripAdvisor and Foursquare. We have microblogging like Twitter. Plurk, Tumblr, 4chan, uh, 8chan for that matter, uh, 4chan, for those of you, I, there was a question earlier about 4chan, somebody mentioned 4chan and 8chan as well. Uh, these are becoming famous because these are kind of the places where you see a lot of right-wing, uh, very, uh, very strident neo-Nazi uh, groups and hate groups are starting to gather on these sites themselves. Uh, so 4chan uh, actually morphed into 8chan, which is also called Infinity Chan, uh, or it's stylized as an infinity symbol and then Chan. The New Zealand shooter announced his attack before he did it on 8chan. The El Paso shooting in August 2019, 20 minutes before he started shooting, he posted on 8chan that he was going to kill all Mexicans uh, in the Walmart, and he actually put the manifesto up before killing 22 people and injuring 26 others. He was using social media to portray that message. And earlier, Tim mentioned in his remarks, uh, reference back to Jenkins' remark um, in 1974, I think it was, that terrorism is theater. Um, social media allows that theater to play out real time in front of people, and they can watch this happen. The Taliban is taking advantage of this. They actually have an increasing presence. They broadcast in six different languages on Twitter. Um, they have Arabic, English, Pashto, Persian, Turkish, and Urdu that they're using on Twitter. And this is in a country that has a 31% literacy rate. And they're moving over to social media as a way to legitimate their presence and their communications. There are also photo sharing applications, right? So we have Instagram and Imgur, Snapchat and Pinterest. Now why this matters is these are ephemeral, right? So Snapchat, you send a message, the message disappears. So you have the potential to communicate globally with other users in a way that is not traceable where that message actually disappears. Uh, there are music and video sharing. Facebook Live, you can, you can stream it while you're doing something. And in fact, uh, this was used by the New Zealand shooter when he announced he was going to engage in the shootings in Christchurch on 8chan. He then, with a, Go a GoPro camera, filmed his shooting live on Facebook Live, then reposted it to YouTube um, and to Twitter, and then commented on it on Reddit, using all of these different social media platforms to get his message out. Other video sharing, YouTube, Vine, Periscope, Vimeo, TikTok, of course, is Chinese control. The US Department of Defense recently announced that none of their uh, personnel could use TikTok or have TikTok on their devices uh, because there's a lot of concern about ways in which that's being used for espionage. Now, in addition to these video sites, there are discussion sites like Reddit um, or Quora, and there are chat rooms. So for instance, in WhatsApp, if you look at the Taliban's chat rooms on WhatsApp, they include numbers from Afghanistan, the Emirates, Iran, Kuwait, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, bringing together people from around the world in a common interest. There's also the final category is the sharing economy. And this is one that the London mayor actually has been very critical of, the sharing economy. And this is things like Airbnb or Rover. Uh, you can apparently share both pets and care of pets, depending on when you go on vacation. Um, that, that this is actually seen as really undermining fair wage and decent working conditions, the kind of new share economy that's been uh, growing here. So what do we get from this? Well, these are new relationships. And these are relationships that allow people to do things they couldn't do before 
or things that they could do before but can do it much quicker, much cheaper, much more easily. So for instance, look at international recruitment for terrorist organizations, ISIS. Uh, Pete Singer, one of my uh, friends and colleagues from, uh, from we were post postdocs together sitting in a closet at Harvard in, in the good old days, uh, he's now written a wonderful book called Like War, which looks at social media, and he's documented how ISIS uh, has actually uh, recruited 30,000 foreign fighters from social media. So ISIS, uh, according to RAND, actually, there are 40,000 foreign fighters from 110 countries. Pete puts the number at 30,000 that were recruited over social media specifically. Um, they opened about a dozen new franchises from Libya and Afghanistan to Nigeria and Bangladesh. Uh, where they're not possible, they're inspiring lone wolves in Paris, Sydney, uh, Orlando, San Bernardino, all around the world. Um, and all the while, they're spreading fear, right? This is part of it. Not only do these social media sites allow individuals to recruit, allow organizations to recruit, but they also allow for fundraising and targeted global financial fundraising so they can engage in solicitation, crowdsourcing, charitable contributions, use of cryptocurrencies, all of this is made possible. Dash, for instance, um, has used Twitter specifically uh, to try to raise funding. In addition, you can have radicalization. So AQAP uh, issued a digital magazine online using these social media platforms, which ostensibly was the inspiration behind the Boston Marathon bombing. It was actually a digital magazine put out by them. In addition to fundraising, radicalization, and recruitment, you also have international direction and control. So this means both planning and actually carrying out operations, that this can be done internationally. They can direct the, the bad actions from far away. They can spread at the speed of light communications to actually activate cells. They can coordinate their actions across numerous countries. Um, and it can be very difficult for law enforcement or the intelligence agencies to follow when you have so many social media networks and side rooms and chat rooms and different ways of communicating globally online through international companies that aren't all located on domestic soil. In addition, it's anonymous. So you might not even know before with the IRA, for instance, with this, even with the cell system, each cell had to know at least one or two people in the, in the cell above in order to know that so the quartermaster might not know who the direction was coming from in the cell above within the structure when they moved to a cell structure. Now, that could be totally anonymous. They can be directed by individuals they've never met, they don't know their names, they have false identities, they've never seen them. In fact, they could be located half a world away. That is new, and they have instantaneous connection uh, with these individuals. In addition, uh, this has given groups access to critical expertise, whether it's CRISPR gene editing and synthetic biology and the new iterations of biological weapons that we're going to be seeing, I would bet, uh, that this is what's coming down the pike, or nuclear expertise, or perhaps political expertise and understanding of different regions. It has provided these organizations with political support. This is the ocean. This is a new ocean. And it's a new ocean in which they can swim. So this idea that this didn't even exist before, and now we have this massive international ocean to swim in, to be able to facilitate some of these actions, um, and the evolution of these non-governmental social networks. Uh, the final final point I want to make just about this revolution is that it's ubiquitous. It's 24-7, 60-60 access. It is not a newspaper that you get every morning at 7 o'clock on your porch leaning against the step. This is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You have access to individuals and to information and to the ability to make changes in this world. The second category, and Bruce, this is coming back to your remarks earlier about the mental health issues. I think this is a very serious aspect of social media that also plays into uh, to, to, to very real concerns about the violence. The emotional impact of social media cannot be underplayed. This is, this is extremely important. So we're seeing right now an increase in stress and alienation, primarily from aggression 
online in the United States. Uh, young girls are three times as likely to commit suicide as they were 10 years ago. And this is when we, the actual numbers of young women aged 16 to 21 was dropping. That number has now skyrocketed again. And part of that is an increase in depression. Uh, Cal Newport, one of my colleagues here at Georgetown, he's done research looking at how social media, and in particular, the way in which individuals and young people in particular who are using it more and more, which of course is the critical group for terrorist organizations and political violence, that it actually creates a sort of social starvation. So you think of it as social media, oh, you're connecting with others, but actually your brain needs to have social interaction. It has to be tactile. You have to smell it and feel it in a three-dimensional world. So the assumed social connections that you get online, you're not satisfying your brain's need for actual social connectedness. And the more time you spend online and not actually interacting with others, you end up starving your brain of that social interaction, that social connection with others. In addition, we see these rocketing, just skyrocketing levels of depression in the United States, and that's tied to the like function. So when that like function was added, social media shifted from being, oh, hi, hello, how are you? I do this, you do this, to here's who I am, judge me. Is this good or not? What do you think about me? What do you think about this self that I'm portraying? And we're seeing increasing levels of depression and anxiety, particularly anxiety, coming out of that sense of others needing to like you in order to bolster your sense of self-confidence. That is a cultural phenomenon that we're seeing. We're also seeing an increase in fear and anger. So it turns out that the things that travel most swiftly through social media are fear and anger. And there's study after study after study has shown this. Um, and part of this is the structure, right? Part of it is the structure of how, the, how social media works. So news comes in and somebody says, because it's not really news, right? It's, it's emotionally mediated news. So the news comes in and one person says, oh my gosh, I'm so angry about this. And they, they, they put a heart, right? Because of course a like doesn't mean you endorse it. It just means, okay, I'm just upset about this. Somebody else is neutral. Somebody else says, I love this. The people who put the heart on it and say, this makes me so angry, that is much more likely to be picked up and carried on by others and amplified by further emotional content, increasing levels of fear and, and hatred in many cases as well. And there, there are many studies actually that the support that this is actually how it works. Um, and the problem here is that there's no cooling off period. So you read it and you respond right away, right? So there's no chance for reason to intervene. There's no chance to check the facts to see if that's right. Um, and so you weigh in on this right away um, and you get a dopamine hit every time somebody likes something you put out. So you become chemically addicted. So a number of these companies had dopamine consultants who helped them to understand how young people could get essentially addicted to social media by getting a dopamine hit from the like function. So if you echo this and put it out and 500 people say, oh yeah, I totally agree with that, you're getting dopamine hits from that. So it's encouraging that amplification of the message itself. Um, there's also this sense of, um, uh, of principle. So when you suddenly are exposed to information that maybe you didn't know before, may or may not be true, uh, you, you find out about it for the first time, you react to it. And this reminds me of this old joke from Belfast where Seamus and Mark were playing in the playground um, and Seamus came up and, and hit Mark, right? Um, and Mark said, what, what's that for? And he said, that's because your people laid siege to Derry in 1689. And Mark said, but that was 1689. And he's like, yeah, but I just found out about it, right? Um, and there's a sense of, of outrage that people feel based on principle and powerlessness and lack of an ability to respond to it. The final areas that I, I do want to mention are is this creation of a false reality. So social media is a false reality. It is a false re reality in many senses. It gives the impression th uh, that everybody does, says, or experiences X, you know, whether it's waking up with makeup on looking perfect, right, or whether it's a right-wing, alt-right kind of hatred invectives towards immigrants. It also is a socially constructed, emotionally augmented factual world. So that's not a factual world. That is a socially, emotionally augmented world. There's also a lack of nuance. 40 characters is not a lot of time to actually treat the complexity of these issues, which means that a lot of information is not actually accurate. And it turns out 
a lot of it's not true. And that's because there aren't fact checkers, there's no attribution, there's no way to check information that comes out. In addition, um, and, and, and when that happens, you have stereotyping, you have cognitive biases that kick in, you have anchoring bias, mirroring bias kick in. In addition, you can create uh, sock puppets, right? You can create false identities. So An Angie Dixon appeared right before the Unite the Right rally. She wrote, Christian first, I want my country back. MAGA, usually outspoken, conservative depending on the issue. Don't mess with me, girl, follow me. Uh, well, as soon as Unite the Right started, she started putting statements out against Democrats and the media um, that BLM and Antifa violence in Charlottesville was not being adequately covered. Um, it said her tweets became increasingly strident. Well, it turned out she was, she was false, right? She was a Russian uh, sock puppet, a Russian identity put out. In fact, she was one of 60,000 sock puppets on one botnet. And there were many, many thousands of botnets actually operating during the election. And it's not just in the United States. During Brexit, about 20% of the online users were actually bots. In the US 2016 presidential election, Twitter concluded that bots drove Russian-generated propaganda to users 470, uh, sorry, 454.7 million times. Bots have been used in the Mexican elections, the Copernic NFL boycott, the spread of anti-vaxxer campaigns, et cetera. And adding to this is the problem of deep fakes, right? Both substitution, um, adaptation, and generation. Now, the First Amendment has a lot to say about the marketplace of ideas, right, that truth will out. But the doctrine was developed in the shadows of this concept of values and belief about facts and the idea that you want to protect different beliefs about facts. So whether the world is flat or God exists or Elvis is dead, that these relate to, to knowledge of some truth or some belief. <laughs> But the doctrine is not oriented to decreasing public belief in false factual propositions. And the chief reason is we don't want to put the government in that position. So as Justice Holmes said in a famous case in Abrams in 1919 in the United States, the best test of truth is the power of thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, right? That this marketplace will out. Well, how does a marketplace out when a deep fake could show troops amassing on the border of Pakistan and India believes that it's now under attack? How does truth out when there's no time between the receipt of that information and having to act to respond to it? Um, I'll just conclude now with, with, with a couple more observations about social media. First of all, it's privately controlled. Uh, it is driven by the industry's underlying interests. So 85% of Facebook's earnings come from advertising. Advertising based on the number of users, which increases depending on the dissent that's actually being expressed. The angrier people get, the more people look at it. It's not in Facebook's interest to drive people off of its platform, not least because competitors will then fill the space. These companies are very, very wealthy. Facebook is valued at $410 billion. Um, and they're, they can control global perceptions, communications, and ultimately relationships. And the final point, the reason this matters is because social media networks can be manipulated. And the way this is done is by building or identifying the key nodes in that network, which can then be neutralized, pressured, or forced to act in certain ways so that others in the network can then act. So the issue is not just building the structure itself or manipulating the structure, the electorate, a la Cambridge Analytica, but it's then causing change in this world based on what that network does. This is exactly what the United States attempted to do with Zunzunio, a Cuban Twitter uh, that was set up uh, based on football scores, football in the soccer sense, football scores, um, music, weather reports. It was then going to be used to try to cause a Cuban spring much like the Arab Spring by pressuring these nodes with a high eigenvector centrality. The state of social network analytics and algorithmic analysis has really catapulted this world forward to where these social networks can not only be created and formed but then manipulated in ways that have a dramatic impact on democracy. Thanks. Uh, well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, two outstanding presentations involving process, principle, uh, information, and analysis. It's what conferences like this ought to be. 
Now, there are roving microphones, uh, and who would like... I'm rather blinded by the uh, lights, because this is all being recorded for posterity. So if I'm not appearing to catch... If you're not appearing to catch my eye, uh, you can, if necessary, be vociferous in your own uh, process. Yes, uh, on this the is left. A two part question. The first one is kind of an auxiliary of what uh, Dr. Donahue said, in that uh, there are cases here in the United States, actually locally, where there are individuals who some say, depending on the prosecution or the defense, that the person is mentally ill, they're off their you know, medication, but yet they go through their. Uh, Facebook and other accounts, and you know they're looking at these sites that are either neo-Nazi or they're you know jihadist sites, and so both sides go back and forth. Is this a case of someone who is a mentally ill, or b really should be charged as a terrorist because they're you know reading all these sites? Mm -hmm. How do you differentiate between that you know on both sides? The second one is is I think Sirhan Sirhan always comes on for parole. For those who don't know who he is, in the late 60s, he assassinated, killed uh, Robert Kennedy, Robert the Kennedy. Uh, brother of the president, when he was running for president as well. During the trial that went on, it was just a simple murder case. But later, about 20 years later, David Frost, the interviewer, had a chance to talk to Sirhan Sirhan, who said, well, I'm really just a Palestinian, and I thought that you know Bobby Kennedy was selling uh, fighter jets to the Israelis, and I thought he should die. And so I'm just wondering if that case was to occur today, you know, what would be the case? By the way, as you know, in California, they did away with the death penalty, so he got life imprisonment with parole. And so things have changed a lot since then till now, dealing with the law of, uh, you know, of terrorism and acts of that kind of violence. Thank you. Right. Uh, we'll take threes, I think. Um, anyone? Who, who else? Yes, in the, re in the red top, cardigan, dress. Thank you. Blazer. <laughs> I'm sorry, say again? <laughs> oh, no. joke, it's fine. Blazer, <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> uh, this question is for Lord Carlisle. You spoke at length on jury nullification or jurors reacting negatively to legislative overreach. Um, American legal scholars usually talk about jury nullification in the context of the civil rights movement and unequal enforcement of the laws or uh, public indecency uh, ordinances used to repress uh, sexually promiscuous women or minorities or holders of unpopular opinions. Um, in practice, American courts uh, understandably try to shield jurors from jury nullification um, in order to protect the court from being undermined. My question is, um, well, my, my two questions are, uh, first, jury nullification in British courts, is this unique to terrorism cases? And my second question is, given that British courts don't filter jurors the way that American courts do, um, is there a tension in the court to shield jurors from awareness of jury nullification? Okay, and third, back to the left. Um, my question is about uh, legal responses to the Christchurch shooting. Um, so after the attack occurred, we saw the live stream video rapidly spread across the internet um, and be turned into memes by those who supported the terrorism. In response, we saw the government of New Zealand criminalize the possession and sharing of the video and the manifesto. Uh, do you foresee other governments seeking to take legal action against those who possess and share videos or material related to mass shootings or terrorist attacks? if more attacks occur where the media created by the perpetrator becomes available? Very good. Uh, three separate issues. So we start with Bobby Kennedy. Uh, who would, which of you would like to take that? The illustration about Bobby, about Bob, Sirhan Sirhan, in, in, in effect. I'll take his first question. Oh, right, different, okay. right. Okay. Uh, the first part of your question, not the... Uh, not second, the second part, not the Kennedy part, but the on the related to the material, the reading of the material, um, that's protected, right, under the First Amendment. What you read is absolutely protected, and this is why when the USA Patriot Act came out, there was the uh, the, the so titled the so, so called uh, library provision, which gave the government the power to obtain tangible things. This was Section two fifteen of the Patriot Act, um, tangible things um, to uh, demonstrate that we're. Uh, 
of, of views that were reasonable grounds to believe were relevant to an authorized investigation. And so there was this assumption that you could go into a library and just collect the records. And so across the United States, the ALA, the American Library Association, uh, rebelled. They started uh, shredding records. They put up signs. Um, my favorite, Humboldt County passed a resolution saying anybody using Patriot Act powers in its jurisdiction would be fined $1,000, uh, calling out the library provision. A friend of mine in the bureau said that he would go slap down 1000 and say, I'll be here a while. Um, you know, so um, so there, there, there is this very fiercely protective First Amendment right to read what you want. And this goes to the search for truth and autonomy. You know, that if we're not free to read what we want, then we can't develop like who we are as, as individuals. And, um, and that's true even for threats, right? Like this idea you, that you can use hyperbole. You can say false things about public figures. The fact that they're a public figure means that you can, you can say all sorts of things as long as it's not said with actual malice, right? This actually is not a tort to say, so there's a famous case on this New York Times versus Sullivan where all sorts of things were said, or Hustler, right? Another great case where Jerry Falwell was shown by, in a vodka ad, as having sex with his mother in an outhouse. And the response of the court, unanimous court, was that's protected speech, right? Like you can say what you want about public figures. And the bar is very high for a true threat. If you look at like Watts versus the United States and kind of the set of cases around true threats. So what you read and what you say outside of the incitement standard laid out in Brandenburg in 1969, which is it has to be directed to producing imminent lawless action and likely to produce that action, outside of that, Verbiage is protected under the First Amendment because it goes to these underlying values. And, and this is the rub, right? The, the way in which these values are the oxygen that in which this environment can be exploited. But without that oxygen, we're no longer the type of country we have been for 200 years. And I think that's a very difficult question of what to do about that. Do you want me to answer the Bobby Kennedy? Yes, Bobby point. Kennedy, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. And then um, uh, m moved on to jurors, if you would. Okay. Directly well, first relevant. of all, the Robert Kennedy point. <clears throat> um, i give you an example of how things, fortunately, have not changed. And this is an illustration of my point that one should have legislation that's durable for events that may, may not be anticipated. Um, a, a very good British MP, Joe Cox, was murdered by a man called Thomas Marizer terrorist um, act by a lone wolf, or as a German friend of mine rather better calls them, lonely wolves. And um, he was prosecuted in an ordinary murder trial with an ordinary jury in an ordinary way by a group of very good but normal lawyers. And I'm confident that certainly in uh, the United Kingdom, and I suspect still certainly in most parts of the United States, a Robert Kennedy type killing would be prosecuted in the normal way here because the law is durable in that sense. Just if I may, a word on mental illness, the first question. One of the things I discovered when I was doing some detailed work on the prevent strand of counterterrorism policy recently is partly about mental illness, but specifically about autism. There is now a huge amount of evidence that lone wolves or lonely wolves on the whole are on the autism spectrum and well on it. And they are not in that sense conventional uh, sufferers from a mental illness. They suffer from a permanent condition. And a great deal more work now is being done on autism, not least to decide whether it's a good public policy decision that the person concerned should be prosecuted rather than placed in a mental health setting or some similar type of setting. And I think that's an important issue that deserves a lot more discussion. Juries to the lady in the blade, the woman in the blazer. Um, no, the now famous, the famous blazer. The famous blazer. <laughs> um, to answer your factual question, juries are selected in exactly the same way in England and Wales, and I believe in Scotland, whether the case is one of burglary or a dwelling house, or murder of a prime minister or or a terrorist offence. The juries are selected randomly. Uh, people can only be excused from jury service if they have some overwhelming reason, like um, they're about to have a child in the next two weeks and the case will last six months, or some similar reason. Occasionally, overwhelming business issues. But by and large, juries are random. And they look it, and they act it, and they're all the better for it, in my view and the views of most British lawyers. 
Dealing with your other point, which is a really interesting and complicated one, I call this the point about myths and stereotypes. Um, prosecutors in particular in the United Kingdom have spent a great deal of recent years trying to remove myths and stereotypes from court cases. So to take a, an old, old one that used to be used when I was a young barrister doing lots of very ordinary, if they can be described as that, rape trials, mm -hmm. if the female victim was out at night on, in cold weather wearing not a great deal of clothing, then there was a sort of myth that she was asking for it, really, so it couldn't possibly have been a rape. Now, that kind of stuff has been got rid of, by and large. It's obviously very difficult to deal with people's deep-rooted prejudices, which still do exist. But I think that the court system, and the judiciary in particular, can do a great deal of work in that context to remove those assumptions. The way we train judges in England and Wales, which is through something called, rather grandly called the Judicial College, it's judicial, but there isn't a college. It provides part-time courses. A great deal of focus is provided on removing those myths and stereotypes from terrorism and also sex cases. Indeed, many of us, my, I and my wife as well, because she does the same sort of thing, are graduates of what is rather unhappily called the serious sex course. But it is one of the best pieces of judicial training in the world. And the third question? Yeah, so, and I, I want to uh, agree with uh, Lord Carlyle that the, on the jury nullification, this is one of the greatest checks in our democracy. It is the check on the prosecutors, on their use of these authorities and ways in which society objects. And there have been, for instance, the Espionage Act cases, there have been repeated grand jury nullifications. So grand jury, of course, being before you have the petite jury, the grand jury has to pass a bill of indictment. Um, and grand juries have repeatedly uh, nullified efforts to use the Espionage Act to go after leakers when they bring information to the public. So it's actually, that's where you see it yeah. appear often in, the, in this context. Um, on this question of the legality uh, of whether you can make it illegal to have footage or show footage, uh, that is unconstitutional. I would take that straight to the Supreme Court. This idea that you can't show it, that would get the freedom of the press, right? It's, so if CNN wants to show what happened and have a comment on it, if I, as a, as a professor, say in a public school, want to show the Twin Towers coming down, um, if an artist in New York wanted to do a display about it, this goes to the heart of the First Amendment, right? This is the right of the people to engage with ideas. Now, this is different from child pornography, where the harm is the publication of that imagery for the child. Uh, this is different. This is about an incident that happens. It's a po political interest, public interest, that goes to democratic representative government and the extent to which you are or are not safe in society. This, I think, is absolutely foundational. And I think it's unconstitutional to criminalize the use or showing of it. Uh, and that's the rub, right? Our social media companies press? Um, are they just a platform? Uh, how do we think about blogs? How do we think about this media in a world that no longer looks like it did in 1789? This is something we take a different view of in the United Kingdom, uh, partly because we don't have a written constitution. And, you know, there is certainly an appetite in the United Kingdom, and there is some existing legislation that if a, an image is taken as likely to radicalize people to violence, then it can be a criminal offence to watch it. And indeed, if possible, it's removed from internet availability in the UK. So that, for example, watching the beheading with knives of prisoners by a British uh, terrorist called Jihadi John, um, that, that is something that is now, I believe, is it still available? I think not, probably in Britain. Not by conventional means, anyway. Uh, just about myself, on the um, question of uh, rape, I, like Alex, both prosecuted and defended in rape cases in my professional life. And I have to say, in as so far as criminal trials are concerned, I find them both the most, the most difficult and the most unsatisfactory because they were, to a very large extent, conditioned by these myths. Now, one of the myths on the part of those who were prosecuting was that the more women that you got on the jury, the more likely there would be for a conviction. Why? Because women would be uh, more critical uh, of the victim. And the opposite was true. Indeed. Mm. On the assumption, for not only perhaps that she'd been out uh, at a party or something of the kind,
but that she'd had something to drink. And so all these myths rather piled up. And that was one of the thing, one of the reasons why these cases were often very unsatisfactory, either because what should have been convictions were not obtained, uh, or because legitimate defences fell. Uh, so I don't look back upon it with uh, any great deal of enthusiasm, but as has been said, it's, uh, things are changing. And just very quickly on the question of jurors, position is exactly the same in Scotland. Scotland has a separate legal jurisdiction. Scottish law is, fine, is a civil law system. Uh, you don't have that in this country with the one exception of one state in the south. Uh, but that's because Scottish, because in England, Scotland and England were at each other's throats. The Scottish scholars went to Leiden and Utrecht in Holland and they brought back the law they learned there, which was a civil law system based on Roman law. Uh, so, as I said, uh, you come along here, you always learn something new every day. More questions, please. And by the way, I'm going to exercise slight editorial discipline and say you're allowed one question and not two. Yes, who's first? Hi, thank you very much for um, your comments today. Dr. Donahue, I'm especially interested in what you were talking about with um, all the information that's out there, especially as it relates to CRISPR technology, BW in general. Um, you know, there's just a the general discourse that comes from um, experts and scientists out there sharing information. Of course, we would never want to stem that tide, but we always worry about um, the weaponization by um, anyone seeking to do ill. Um, so I guess my question is, um, what are your thoughts on sort of the, the sort of policy, legal implications of trying to influence or counter that narrative of any sort of um, state entities trying to uh, put out disinformation or control the appearance of that information on platforms or even interact with people showing interest in that sort of information? Um, whether in their official, official capacity or um, poten potentially taking on some sort of um, virtual persona. Thank right. you. Right, if that's one, two, please. Anyone else? Yes, at the back. Hi, um, my question is regarding the globalization of terrorism, especially with social media. To what extent does this necessitate a cooperative security response, and to what extent would that actually be practical? Right, cooperation. And third, surely you have not been silenced by the intellectual quality of the presentations. <laughs> uh, oh yes, right at the, on the right, as I look. Um, so, Dr. Donahue, it seems like we're in something of a bind, but given that you've said that we're in a, there's a legal tradition of free speech, but also that said speech is, is hard to police and can be inciting. In other words, to put it simply, is there any hope for the future? <laughs> <laughs> well, that seems to be a matter of philosophy, perhaps, <laughs> rather than anything else. That's two questions directly to yourself, Dr. So would you like to do one and three? Sure. And then we'll ask uh, Alex Carlyle to talk about cooperation and to make a comment or two on one and two. Sure. So first on scientific speech. So under the Atomic Energy Act in the United States, uh, all nuclear information is classified from birth. So if somebody in this room comes up with a really cool atomic device, you can't tell the person next to you. You can't tell your mother. You can't tell anybody, even if you're not government funded, even if you have no access to any government facilities, everything is classified from birth. Um, that was our model for scientific speech for many years. Uh, until this case comes along, coincidentally, during 2001. Uh, so in Australia, every four or five years, there was a sudden increase in the rodent population, and they would wipe out the crops. And so some researchers in Australia had this idea, wow, if we can find a disease that's highly virulent um, and have it transmit, but have it transmit the inability to reproduce. So we don't kill all the rodents at once and then have disease, but they just live out their lives without reproducing, then we can stop having this hit to the GDP every time they 
eat the crops. So they took a, a particular um, uh, disease, mouse pox, which is closely related to human smallpox, which is the number one killer of human beings in history. And they took mouse pox and they found that some of the mice were immunoresistant to mouse pox. So they, they did a very easy tweak, a very simple tweak that took you know, three feet of countertop, $1,000 and a basic degree in undergraduate microbiology. And they came up with a disease that was 100% lethal. And so the question is, what do they do? Do they publish this or do they not? So initially they told the military, to their knowledge, the military did nothing about it. They published it in February 2001 in the American Society for Microbiology in a journal um, under the rather innocuous title um, uh, Interleukin 4. You know, it's just one of these like biological titles that came out. Well, nothing happened until the anthrax mailings that followed 9-11. And Ron Atlas, who was the head of the American Society for Microbiology, got called to the White House and told that if he didn't stop articles like this from coming out, that actually they would pass a law and get it through Congress censoring microbiologists and not allowing them to publish anything. Okay, now this was problematic at, at many, many levels, not least because a, a disease that's 100% lethal will burn itself out. It actually is not a very effective disease. So the Spanish flu had like a two to 5% um, kind of lethality rate and it was able to persist and be carried from host to host because of that. But even with that rate, it killed 50 million people. I actually was at the National Archives in London researching the Spanish flu, which was initially thought to be a biological weapons attack launched. Um, so Lord Hankey formed the Biological Weapons Committee in response to the Spanish flu um, in the United Kingdom. So, so, so if you look at this, okay, what if our biologists can't publish basic microbiology? Well, think about virology. Almost anything could be weaponized and used against people, right? So yes, it can be used as a BW, but it can also be used for just fabulous advances, right? Think CRISPR, right? Think of what you can do. So for two years, I did a study with the National Academies um, on synthetic biology, looking at biological weapons. And synthetic biology uses chemistry and physics and biology, and they use it to, to create new life forms. It's crazy. You can grow semiconductors out of sludge by using chemistry and biology. You can, you can do just like the most incredible things with synthetic biology. In fact, there's a high school competition at MIT every year where high school students come and create new life forms using bio biological processes like a screwdriver, right? That's the world we're in. So that train has left, has left the station, right? So do you really want the government to be coming in and saying, you can publish this, but you can't publish this, especially when you have much higher likelihood, but lower consequence in the sense of it's not the Big Bang BW, but how many tens of thousands of people die from flu every year? You know, what about normal diseases? Do we really want to stifle scientific publication? And I would argue that that's different than nuclear materials and nuclear information. That when you're talking about basic biology, we can't afford to stifle that. And the mousepox case is instructive because after they published it, an international team at Chicago started working on it and they found a solution. So if that ever were weaponized, if anybody did figure out that mutation or how to do it, or even if it happened naturally, they would be able to counter it if it were engineered onto a human smallpox. So that's the kind of information you actually want out there. So more minds are working on it to kind of shore up those vulnerabilities. That would be kind of my response. As for any hope for the future, um, education. I really think that's it. I think it's going to take a much better educated population, um, a much more sophisticated understanding of social media and the role that it plays in our lives, a much healthier skepticism towards what you see and hear, and the growth of verified information sources so that you know that what you're getting is actually accurate. And I think that's going to take a lot of time and a concerted effort from both societies, frankly, to really educate the population about the risks of, of this kind of world that we're entering. Uh, Alex's cooperation, hope for the yeah. future? Um, well, I would be very much in favor of a cooperative security response if I was uh, assured that what would be produced as the policy was the highest common factor of uh, what is produced by the different countries. But I have a fear that it would be more likely to produce the lowest common multiple and therefore would not be terribly effective. Um, and you know, I can give evidence as to why I believe that. At the moment, there are three countries in the European Union, Hungary, Poland, and Romania, in which there are severe doubts about the independence of the judiciary and therefore about the rule of law itself to the extent that the European Union itself has been severely critical of political changes in those countries. And there are other examples. Um, look at NATO at the moment, um, not least because of um, 
the attitudes of certain very senior politicians not a million miles from where we're sitting now uh, and the uh, views of President Erdogan of Turkey. NATO is in as unstable a position, and you're an expert on this, Ming, but I think as unstable a position as we've seen in some years. And then another piece of evidence is British politics. British politics on the 12th of December emerged from three years at the political laundromat. And the reason it, it was in the laundromat for so long was because there was a big battle going on about whether we should be in a cooperation situation or whether we should use those great British principles which our Prime Minister tells us are in every way superior to everyone else. It's not something I believe, by the way. Uh, in order to be able to make our minds up and cooperate a choix and when we feel like it. So that is the current trend. However, there are some very important and encouraging pieces of cooperation on security matters, not least the Five Eyes cooperation, which includes Britain and the United States and other countries in relation to intelligence, bilateral relationships, particularly the very strong one between the United Kingdom and the United States of America, and actually, despite Brexit, Britain's very strong relationship with European Union countries through various institutions which we're now leaving in relation to security matters. But though we are leaving some of those institutions, nevertheless, the relationships are absolutely bound to continue. I just want to mention one thing. In a few years ago, I was asked by the then British government to do a review of the definition of terrorism in British law. <laughs> and that involved reviewing the black letter terrorism laws of, I think from memory, 181 countries. And I read them all. I had a Cambridge researcher helping me to do it. And I visited some of the countries that had black letter law that looked even better than our own and yours. But some of those countries were places where people were never tried for terrorism offences because they disappeared before they got to trial, having been arrested, where the black letter law looked superb, but the way in which the authorities carried out their functions was wholly unacceptable. So I fear we have to regard cooperative security responses as being somewhat hemmed in by reality. Uh, <clears throat> since NATO was mentioned, I might remind those who may not have heard of how it was conceived, but it was conceived immediately after the Second World War's North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It now consists of 29 members. In the first place, it was eight, then it went to 12. And very gradually, as countries have escaped from the yoke of uh, communism, they have sought to preserve their independence by joining, first of all, the European Union, but second, NATO. Uh, it was described in its uh, gestation, early gestation, by a British politician has been designed to keep the Americans in, to keep the Russians out, uh, and it was 1947 when it was created, and to keep the Germans down. Uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War, it's hardly surprising that those were the objectives. But it remains the single most successful defensive organization ever in history. And the difficulties caused by President Trump are made all the more difficulty all, all, all the more effective, if you like, because he actually has a point. Because the United States, I don't know if you know this, is the, is the largest contributor by a very, very substantial <laughs> amount to the budget of NATO. And NATO countries are under obligation following a recent summit, which was held in um, Wales, uh, to spend 2% of GDP on their defence. And there are only about five or six countries, including the United Kingdom, I have, I'm happy to say, but there are only about five or six countries that have done so. And one of the countries which has not done so is Germany. And Germany, of course, has the largest economy in Europe. And as a consequence, President Trump, it's hardly surprising, says, well, why should we in the United States pay over the top, as it were, for the defence of Europe uh, when there are countries which are better able to make a larger contribution than they do. And that has created a sense of crisis. Some of that is abated, but they had a meeting in London uh, just before Christmas, which they don't call a summit, because if they called it a summit, they'd have had to produce a communique afterwards. 
and they would have found a great deal of difficulty uh, in finding a common text that all countries should support. So they simply called it the meeting of the heads of the nations of the members of NATO. Uh, I apprehend that lunch is Can upon us. Yes, of course. Forgive me for interrupting, but there was a question about counter-narrative that I'd like oh, to yes, answer of course, from by all means. somewhere down there. Um, you get full value here, I want you yeah. to know. <laughs> As it happens, we have five daughters, so I live in a, in a family full of very strong-minded, clever women. And it's easy to say yes, but sometimes we have arguments. <laughs> and uh, one, of, one of our daughters, who's a lawyer and quite left-wing at the moment, she, she might grow out of it one day, <laughs> she confronted me one evening at dinner and she said, um, I don't have a problem about the British government taking down internet sites which are, which are <laughs> radicalising, but I have a real problem about uh, middle-aged men in suits, and I'm merely quoting her, uh, <laughs> middle-aged men in suits thinking they can write a counter-narrative and put that up on the internet because it's not their role, they don't know what they're doing, and frankly, it's pretty offensive in principle. Well, we had a, a brief and we had an interesting dinner that evening. <laughs> but she has a point. She does have a point. I think the answer to this is that government... We have a very good organisation, actually, in the United Kingdom called RICU. It's developed a huge amount, and um, you know a lot about RICU, don't you? But it's developed a huge amount in the years I've known it. And it does put up counter-narratives. I think the way to... I don't think it's illegitimate to create counter-narratives, <laughs> but I think you have to have partners in, able to do, in order to be able to do it properly and in a convincing way. And I've been trying to say to our successive governments over the years, you've got to have a much stronger engagement with the private sector. There's, there's a place in London called um, Internet Roundabout, the Old Street Roundabout. Uh, it's just a road intersection. And within 200 metres of the Old Street Roundabout, there are probably 200 companies producing things like computer games, full of brilliant young people writing programmes. And I think governments should be working in partnership with companies like those to try and produce a counter-narrative which at least is interesting to the people who might be looking at these issues on the internet. But I do recognise that the question has a real foundation to it and it's a difficult one to answer. Very briefly on young people. Young people wanted to remain and wanted Britain to remain in the European Union uh, to a far, by a far higher to majority than any other section of the population uh, and it is they and I'm sorry this is a partisan point but I'm sure you will aim off it is a reflection I think on the fact that those of us older uh, have not sufficiently made the case that the population of the United Kingdom as a whole uh, has determined to remain in the European Union by a very narrow majority we've left and those who will have the consequences and the responsibility, most of all, will be the younger generation. So we have not bequeathed them with anything, frankly, that they might have expected and hoped for. Uh, very dangerous when you get lawyers who are like speaking. Uh, twice as dangerous when you get politicians who are also lawyers who are like speaking. <laughs> So I do not intend to stand in front of you uh, so far as lunch is concerned. Bruce, is there any housekeeping that we need to say at this stage? One o'clock. Please assemble again at 1 p.m. <laughs>